can't help all of them. But what if we each helped just one? The El Imdad Foundation now gives you an opportunity to help just one orphan from Syria or Palestine. For just 500 rand per month, you can help safeguard the dignity of an orphan by assisting them with basic needs such as food, clothing, shelter, medical care, and attention. Our orphan sponsorship program allows you to track the progress of your orphan through regular feedback. Make a difference in the life of an orphan today. Visit alimdad.com or call 0861 786 for more information. Listen to something fresh. Listen to Salam Media. 9.32 exactly, and we are joined by Fidel Hafiji, a daily Maverick Associate, Associate Editor. It gives me much pleasure to have her on the show this morning, however, to talk about a very, very serious and sad matter. And that, of course, is the SIU having confirmed that Babita Diokaran was gunned down after dropping a child off at school a few days ago. She was a witness in the 332 million rand PPE scandal. And let's talk to Ferial about the protection of whistleblowers. And as I'm talking to someone in the media, I'm also beginning to wonder, people in the media industry, high-powered people in, in, the, in the media industry, are they also not in the firing line as well? Because they don't, because the nefarious uh, mafia or the third force or these crooks that operate in government um, don't like what we report. Uh, does that not perhaps then mean that uh, media, high-profile media people also uh, are perhaps uh, in the firing line? Firiel, salam alaikum. Welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam, Julie. Thank you for inviting me. Lovely to have you on the show. And has that thought ever crossed your mind, Firiel? Because, I mean, you you really do shoot from the hip, don't you? You call a spade a spade. Hmm. Um, so, Julie, sometimes in, in the course of reporting, I, I have felt unsafe. But there's no evidence that journalists have been targeted for violence other than online. Um, the journalists get hurt in the course of riots and protests. And, in fact, the longest, saddest list um, of people who have died in hit are people like Babita Deokaran who have blown the whistle to take out mafias in government to stop the misspending and then lose their lives. Um, so this week I, I went to her home because the family allowed us to come in and interview them. And it was probably one of the saddest things I've, I've done um, in a long time. Um, she was the backbone of our family, Julie, and mm. she was one of those people who keeps the family together. They said that she arranged plays on Zoom every Friday during COVID, <clears throat> that she had brought her brother who was ill with COVID and his wife into our home to look um, look after them. He sadly passed away only 45 days ago. Oh, no. ago. So a real tragedy, huh? Absolutely. Um, obviously, obviously, the department has failed. I think the SIU has fa failed her dismally. I mean, surely she was a witness in this case. She has been a witness in other cases as well. Why was there no protection? Well, I think that's what our country is looking at now. <clears throat> I asked Kaiser Hanya, who is the spokesperson for the SIU, why didn't she have protection? He said they have thousands of witnesses. And they only extend protection if a person <clears throat> feels like they are unsafe. If they tell the SIU, I've noticed this or that. Um, obviously, they're going to have to rethink that now because she was a high-level witness giving evidence about more than just the, the PPE scandal. Um, and, and he says that they are going to have to relook really at how they extend witness protection because it was so easy to take her take out, you know. Mm. Mm. Um, there wasn't a camera at a complex I saw um, when we went there. And her car that had been used in the hit was parked in the garage. It was pockmarked with bullet holes. And it felt like she had absolutely no protection as she came home from dropping her daughter at school. Now, when we look at this situation, um, we are told that there's an intense investigation 
um, and a way to bring the perpetrators to book. I must be very honest with you, uh, Ephiriel, I, I don't have much, I don't hold out much hope there because I should imagine they're very high level people involved here. Um, we, we don't yet know who they are, except to say that Gauteng Health Department is a real vital pit of corruption. It has been for at least a decade now. Um, the Premier, David Makura, was at the house and he said that um, there was a real high-level SWAT team looking at this and that they were soon to, to make arrests. But I have to tell you that in each of the cases of Moss Pakwe, Jimmy Mushlala, the really big whistleblowers whose lives um, were lost so tragically, not a single person has been brought to book. So I think your suspicion or cynicism about it is, Correct, and this evening there will be a, a vigil for her at the Premier's office to keep up the pressure because otherwise, what does it mean? It means that whistleblowers won't come forward because they are likely to lose their lives. Absolutely, and then the rot runs deeper and deeper yes. and deeper. Uh, a while ago, I spoke to, I think it was Cynthia Stimple. She, yes. she also raised the same issues around about the protection of whistleblowers, how she was threatened. Um, thank God, you know, she's okay. But uh, I should imagine, you know, it's difficult to, to kind of lead a normal life knowing that uh, there's possibly a price on your head. Um, having said that, Feriel, um, what I'm wondering is that I know that Babita was in discussion or she was messaging um, the Ahmed Kathrada Foundation. It yes. seems like she was a good friend of Shan Bolton. Do you think something at that, you know, at that point in those discussions, Shan should have said something or asked her to ask for protection? I'm just wondering where and who and how we slipped up here in protecting this woman. Um, so those messages she, she sent to, to Shan was really sad because she was trying to say to him, not all of us are right people. There's mm. many of us here trying to do the right thing. You, you would have read that. In fact, she was sidelined. She was pushed to a, a district office. Mm. Um, and then once the cleanup started happening, she was brought back and made the chief financial um, officer of the department because they could see how valuable she is. You know, she's someone who started working as a young woman in 1987 in government and she's never left. So she's just one of those people totally committed to government, totally committed um, to her job. And I think from Cynthia's book, the reading it, it's clear that the system must change. The, the law that protects whistleblowers has to really be beefed up. And after Sitting at the Zonda Commission for three years, I think it's going to be one of the key recommendations from the judge is that we have to much better look after our whistleblowers because often they're the only ones standing between us and, and an absolutely corrupt sector. Going forward, we know this is the big story of the week. Possibly in the coming days, we're going to hear more and more about whistleblowers, people that have lost their lives, people who have valuable information to yes. bring government and corrupt the corrupt mafia to book. Your suggestions, Firu, how do we navigate this very dark and murky space? Well, I think it's really great that Cynthia Simple is starting an organization that will be the center point of lobbying for those protections. And I guess as citizens, what we have to do is support initiatives like that so that we do provide better extensions of, of, of care um, and protection to our whistleblowers. Because really, when, you, when you've when you sat at the commission or, or even look, it's only because of people like your Inkadisi Jonas, like Cynthia Stimple, um, like uh, like um, Ms. Masilo Motau, who spoke up at the commission, who really helped us to understand the years of state structure. Um, what I have noticed as a journalist is, is that had an emboldening effect on good civil servants who often come forward and want to tell you things. After this, though, it's clear that they're going to probably be a little more nervous to do that. How do people who are listening to us this morning, people who have been following the killing of yes. Babita, uh, believe that they have very valuable information um, that they can possibly 
uh, you know, share with uh, someone, some authoritative figure to bring these perpetrators to book or any other information that ties in directly with corruption, state capture, et cetera, et cetera. How does that process start? You know, it, it must be very daunting. And must how, be. <laughs> how do they start to get the ball rolling, but also protect themselves in uh, in the process? I mean, if you if you see Cynthia's book is and and it's it's repeated across the other whistleblower stories is they try every means internally possible to raise the alarm, to ask questions, to be difficult people, you know, to stand up for for right and good. It's only right at the end when they've reached the end of their cases that they try and reach out in Cynthia's case to Alta. Um, the organization I mean, mm. tax abuse, mm. which was really helpful to her. Many people will just call up a journalist or get hold of us on Facebook or Gmail, with whatever ways they get, get to you or WhatsApp, because they simply are so frustrated because the internal systems don't work. And I suppose it's about making those external systems more clear and more safe for them to tell their stories. And I should imagine when you have these type of uh, issues, when, when someone reaches out to you, you do then know that you're in it when you commit yourself to assisting. Uh, it's, it's, it's a long haul because there's lots of investigation that needs to happen and um, probably months of hard work before you can break the story. Absolutely. I suppose the best example of it is the... Um, the protections that the Daily Maverick and Amagundani extended to the Gupta whistleblowers, mm. um, those were the people who, who handed over the hard drive that really revealed most of what we know today about state capture. Um, those people first had to be secured and gotten out of the country sure. um, before that story could be broken. So yes, it is a, a daunting responsibility that you take on. What makes me particularly sad is that often there's so many people wanting to tell you things that you that I feel like I don't do justice to their stories, that there's just too much. You have to choose which you think mm. is the most important to do. And that's sad when you have to turn down a story yeah. or an investigation. Uh, so that would be your first uh, port of call, so to speak. Just to digress here, uh, Ethereal, um, where and how far down are we as far as uh, state capture is concerned? Is there a light at the end of the horizon in terms of recouping the trillions of rands that were stolen from us as South Africans? You know, I, I think it's a, it's a long it's a long journey. The um, the Rwanda Commission's been pretty successful at getting back almost a billionaire, and that's what the Commission cost the country. So they've paid for themselves <laughs> yeah. that way, which is great. Um, and and you see the SIU under Andy Motiva is doing great work of getting people to repay. He even docks pensions of of crooked officials. Good. in order that that money comes back into the coffers. So slowly, slowly it's happening. The big work is, of course, um, the Guptas and their allies who ferreted out billions of rands that's now sitting in Dubai, in Hong Kong, wherever. Mm. And the task is to to get that money um, repatriated uh, to us where it belongs. If you read, it looks like they are using our money to extend their business empire into sure. your Kazakhstan, etc. Mm -hmm. What about um, them being extradited? A little while ago, I did read about um, a partnership with South African Interpol uh, and the mm. chances that they may be extradited back to South Africa. Do you think that that could happen? I don't. Eh? So the UAE, specifically Dubai, where they are, is very um, one of the reasons that it does so well is that it's a safe haven mm. for money from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And while the Emirates have said that they support the provision of mutual legal assistance by which that um, Interpol red alert is, is being sought. Um, they haven't really come to the party, Julie, in, in helping along that extradition process. The Guptas, of course, told Judge Zondo they'd like to sit in Dubai and give the evidence by <laughs> yes. Zoom, but he said no way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, Firul, I have to take... Um, I've 
got to make of the course. most of this opportunity to okay. talk to you. So I'm stretching this a bit because I'm not sure when I can pin you down again. Your thoughts on the recent insurrection and the terrible letdown by the uh, state security, uh, you know, as far as South Africa is concerned? No, I, I really have been covering that quite closely and it makes me deeply sad to note that like 45 days on from the hor horrifying week, only about three people have been arrested in who, who might be said to have organized it. The rest are the people who looted, like literally mm. thousands of arrests. And I think those are your ground runners, probably opportunists, but only three organizers have been arrested. And even then, they're really low profile. They're not your, they're not your key linchpins who who organized what was called an insurrection. And to be honest with you, I think the president is dying back from, from taking proper action on that because it's politically difficult to do so. Um, he spoke really strong language on that Saturday night where he said, we won't leave a stone unturned. People are working day and night to get these arrests done, and we haven't seen that. Okay, and that would obviously speak directly to the fact that if they do take a harsh act, they obviously know who the kingpins are, they uh, do, yeah. but the dominoes will start falling then, obviously. And that's the reason yeah, why. I think they're scared of that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. Imperia, let me just give you the last two minutes to summarize on going back to Babita Diokaran, yes. whistleblowers, and what sort of reassurance can government or the powers that be can give to whistleblowers uh, to continue doing what they do? Otherwise, we might as well just close up shop and move out of South Africa or live uh, in the most dire of conditions here. Because sure. we've just become more so, and more corrupt. <clears throat> So it made me really sad to learn that today is the day. I, I suppose they they drove um, Babita Diokaran's mm. um, body back to Durban yesterday, where she'll be buried in her um, with her family in in Phoenix. Um, so we keep her in our thoughts. And I suppose the the lesson out of it is that the protection of whistleblowers lies with civil society making a big noise. I I really don't think politicians are going to extend those additional protection, better witness protection, without all of us insisting upon it to protect these people who are, like you said, so vital to our country. Peter and Happy G. David, Daily Maverick Associate Editor. Um, keep up the great work. What Thank an you, honor chatting to you this morning and hope we will hook up again sometime soon. Definitely. Lovely to chat to you. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. <clears throat> that was Peter and Happy G. talking to us about the killing the assassination, the murder, call it what you will, of Babita Diokaran, a whistleblower in the horrific PPE scandal. And obviously we do know uh, she was working in the very corrupt Department of Health here in Gauteng. 9.49 exactly this 